Hello and welcome to today's virtual event, the Ocean Acidification Day of Action, Shell Shock. My name is Jacqueline Durakis and I'm the Expeditions Manager here at Earth Echo International. We are a nonprofit founded on the belief that youth have the power to change the planet. Our free programs and resources have reached more than 2 million people in 146 countries. Just wanted to remind you all that you can send in questions anytime for our amazing experts, Dr. Phil Gravenise and Dr. Amelia Harrington, and we will answer those throughout today's event. If you're joining in Zoom, please use the Q&A feature to enter those questions. And if you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and use the chat section uh, to enter your questions and we will get to them as we go through the presentation today. Now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, all of you to our two experts, Phil and Amelia, who are going to tell us more about ocean acidification, the impacts on crustaceans, and what we can do to take action. Phil is going to speak to you all first, so Phil, go ahead and take it away. Hey everybody, thanks for being here today and uh, thank you um, to uh, Earth Echo for the invitation to uh, present um, for your virtual field trip. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, I'm a professor at uh, Florida Southern College. Um, I just started there this past fall, but I previously had done my postdoctoral research at Moat Marine Lab um, in Sarasota, Florida, and I received my educational degrees from Florida Institute of Technology um, in marine biology and biology. I often get asked, how did I get into uh, researching crustaceans? Um, and it, a lot of my experience uh, stems from growing up um, outside of Philadelphia and visiting the South Jersey shore with my grandfather in the summer times on, on school break. And uh, I spent a lot of time um, with him going crabbing um, for, for blue crabs, uh, which is a commercial, commercially important fishery um, all along the East Coast. Uh, and then when I went to graduate school, I had the opportunity to continue some of that research with blue crabs, but also um, find some of my own interests, um, which I'm going to talk to you about today. So my lab focuses on determining how different stressors impact the growth and behavior and development of crustaceans from their embryos all the way up to their juvenile and sub-adult stages. And one of the main focal points of my research is uh, determining how these populations or these species might um, be affected by ocean acidification. So here are three of the main species that I work with. Uh, I, I primarily work with Florida stone crab, which you see here on the left. Um, the Florida stone crab is a $30 million a year industry in, in South Florida. Um, I also have done some research with the Caribbean spiny lobster, which is a $500 million industry. Um, and then we've also done some work with the Caribbean king crab um, associated with ocean acidification and coral restoration. But today I'm only going to focus on um, two stories about uh, some of the work I've done with the larvae of the Florida stone crab and the Caribbean spiny lobster. Oh, there you go. So yeah, important fisheries. Um, before I start, though, I wanted to just do a quick refresher of what do we mean by pH or what, what, is, what does it refer to when we talk about ocean acidification. So here I have a pH scale. Um, we measure pH from 0 to 14. And substances that are considered acidic, uh, like your stomach acid or coffee, um, for instance, or orange juice, are lower on the pH scale. So they range from zero to seven, and they're gonna be in that range. And the way we measure that is we, we look to see and count basically how many hydrogen ions are present in that solution. So the red is the hydrogen and the, the OH, the hydroxide ion um, is less when it's, when it's acidic. And then bases are things that you have in your house that are kind of slimy, um, soap or drain cleaner are more are on the uh, on the base scale, high on the base scale. And those are range from seven, from above seven to 14. And when we measure those, we look looking for the opposite trend. We, we, we will see less hydrogen ions and more hydroxide ions present in the in the um, uh, in the solution. The seawater is currently at 8.1, which is why today we are here talking to you because today is 
the 8th of January. So that's, that's what this celebration is all about. Um, so when we say ocean acidification or the ocean is acidifying, that, that really means that the seawater, which is slightly basic, is moving towards a more acidic state. Um, <clears throat> so how does that happen in the ocean? Time for an activity. So what we're gonna do here is uh, I've got a beaker or a glass that I took out of my cabinet. Um, I'm going to add in some indicator solution here. Just give it a second and I'll mix it up for you guys. So you should be able to see that right, blue. Okay. And here is a pH card. So right now on this scale, this blue liquid is about a pH of seven point I think that says four, 7.6. Um, so it's, it's <clears throat> this is going to be a simulation of what can happen with extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna blow into this and then um, you guys should see a change. So give me one second here. So while you're working on your experiment, we wanna give a shout out to Mrs. Young's class who's watching us on YouTube. We're looking for color change here. I see something happening. All right, I'm gonna pass out. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. So oh, hold on. You can see it better if I put a white background behind it. So it's, it's definitely less um, of the blue shade. It's more yellowish, maybe a yellow green. And on that pH scale that I showed you, right? So let's see, we were, we were down at the bottom here. It's now up here towards 6.6 .6 or 6.8. Now that's not the exact scale of the ocean, um, but it's a, it's a good analogy because as we put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide absorbs into the ocean and it reduces the pH over the long long term trend. Um, so my my glass was a model for the ocean, and my exhaling still out of breath. <laughs> my exhaling is um, a model for the carbon dioxide that we put in the atmosphere. Another way that that can happen that we can that we can get a lower pH in the ocean is through coastal processes. So both the stone crab and the spiny lobster are um, coastal species. Um, and this is their range or part of their range that's kind of truncated on this, on this image um, and shown in blue. You can go to the next slide. And in particular in Florida, our population from the US Census Bureau has been exponentially increasing. And you can click again. And if you look at where Floridians like to sell, those red spots, um, you can go ahead and click. And the, on these red spots, those are all coastal areas. We don't live in the middle of our state. We live on the coastline. And when you have um, more development on the coastline, you can, you can keep clicking. Um, you're going to get more runoff. That runoff from, from storms is going to bring extra nutrients and organic matter into the coastal areas. And there are some reports that say that our coastal areas can have a change in pH that is sometimes three times faster. And so in Florida, this is a seasonal um, occurrence that happens during a rainy season. So that's a second way that we can get ocean acidification. So one of the main species I work with, I mentioned, is, this, is the stone crab. And this is what they look like when they release their eggs. The crab, this is a crab in my lab. They get up on their legs. They flex their abdomen. All those little hairs that you see have thousands and thousands of eggs on them. Um, and if you look real closely, yep, thank you for playing that again. If you look real closely, you'll see these little specks in the water column those little specks of the larvae. They're gonna grow up in about two years to become uh, part of the fishery. And that's part of the work that we do. So one of the questions that I always have in my lab is how do the crabs know where to go and does ocean acidification affect their directional ability? They don't have Google Maps, right? They can't just pull up their iPhone and say, oh, type in where I'm going and end up there. Rather, what they do, you can click on the next slide, is they actually rely on cues in the ocean to surf the currents. Um, and so this is how they do that. Um, so they release their eggs 
And they have basically two directions. They can go off into the estuary or close to shore, or they go offshore to develop. Both of these species move their larvae offshore to finish their development. So you can go ahead and click. So this is what their larvae look like when they hatch. So this on the left is a stone crab larva. And on the right side here above the spiny lobster is a uh, spiny lobster larva. And so some of the cues that the stone crab larvae use to identify where they're gonna go are factors that change with depth. So if you go up and down in the water column, we know that as we get deeper in the water column, light is gonna decrease. Temperature is gonna get colder, right? It's gonna, you're not near the surface anymore. You're not near the sun. So it's gonna get cooler as you go down in the water column. Pressure will increase as you go deeper <clears throat> and salinity will increase. So stone crab larvae use a suite of these cues to identify where they are in the water. And you can go ahead and click. So after they hatch, they have a tendency to swim upwards in response to these cues. So they, they go, um, you know, they swim up towards the surface. The surface currents are gonna push them away from land and you can keep clicking. And that's just gonna push those larvae, surf, let the larvae surf their way offshore where they can complete development. As they get older, they're gonna get heavier, they're gonna sink faster, they're gonna reverse their behavior to those cues and then those later larval stages end up getting pushed back towards shore from currents that are on the bottom of the ocean that are going in the opposite direction. So one of the things we did in my lab was look to see what does ocean, oops, <laughs> what does ocean acidification do um, to that swimming behavior? And so we know that they swim up under normal conditions, um, <clears throat> but when we raise these larvae in acidified conditions that are supposed to happen by the mid or end of the century, we saw that those larvae swam down instead at a faster rate as well. So they were moving down, but they were also moving down faster than we, than we thought they would from uh, the control larvae. And that means that those larvae aren't gonna be able to get away from where they hatch. They're gonna get pushed back in through those bottom currents back towards where they, where they were released. I also look at stone or uh, spiny lobsters. And so spiny lobster development is a little bit longer. I don't think I said how long stone crab development takes. Stone crab development takes a month. They're in the water for 30 days. Spiny lobsters are in the water for nine months, wandering the ocean. Then they molt <clears throat> into this, this post-larval stage here that you see on these fingertips, this clear, what looks like a shrimp. And they have these really long antenna. And these antenna are really great at tasting the water column. <clears throat> and they, they sense chemical cues. And so when these post larvae migrate back towards the coast to settle and find a home, they are attracted to a macroalgae that we have here in Florida called Lorentzia. And the Lorentzia gives off these chemical cues in the water column and these um, post larvae can sense it and they go towards it. We have um, lots of evidence that show that they love this kind of macroalgae to hide in. So last year we did an experiment to see does ocean acidification affect their ability to sense that cue. So we, we put out these carpet collectors offshore and then we go out um, after the new moon and we shake them on the boat, we collect the larvae and then we bring them back to the lab and we put them in ambient or control conditions of pH and then we put them in reduced pH as well. And then our experimental setup looked like this. We basically gave them a maze and we said we wanted to watch to see if the larvae could identify the cue after it's been in either the control or the low pH. So here is a reservoir that has just regular seawater. And this seawater has the algae inside of it. So it's gonna give the cue. And so we turn the pump on and the chemicals come down one side of the raceway and none on the other side. And then we watch to see, does the animal go left or right? Does it choose, which, which side does it choose? So here's what we found. Um, this is the number or the proportion of larvae um, and so the first column here, you're gonna see white is the ambient or the control and, and black is the reduced pH. So animals that were not exposed to low pH chose the cue as expected, very, very highly um, effective in choosing the cue over 80%. Whereas animals in reduced pH did not choose um, or had more of a, maybe a more of a difficult time choosing the cue. As far as the control, animals that chose the control. Well, we didn't have any of the control animals choose the blank seawater control. 
which is good because that makes sense. They're all choosing the, the algae. And then we had a few animals uh, in the low pH choose that blank seawater. So maybe they were disoriented. And then when we looked at animals that didn't make a choice, we only had a few animals not make a choice in the control, but most of our low pH lobsters um, end up not making a choice and wandered the chamber. So what does all this mean? These are both really important fisheries in Florida. So for stone crabs, if they can't swim in the right direction um, based on the cues that we know that they respond to, that's going to limit their ability to disperse and migrate. And that could be a problem for them as temperatures continue to warm. Um, they're not gonna be able to expand or move further north away from the tropics that are already um, heating up. Spiny lobsters, ocean acidification might limit um, their ability to find a safe home. They use that algae to hide from predators. And so if they are wandering more, if they are disoriented, if they can't sense the chemical cue that they need to find that algae, um, they're not gonna be able to settle, grow into adults, and they might get eaten by something else that's out there that's hungry. Thank you so much. So um, what we're gonna do is we are going to take um, some questions and we have one coming in from Mrs. Young's class and they're watching on YouTube. And they would like to know, is carbon dioxide being absorbed from the surface of the water where the contact occurs or is it being injected somehow as you showed in your experiment with the straw? So it is, well, <laughs> that's a trick question. Um, both. It depends on the location, but most of the ocean is absorbing at the surface. The gas atmosphere interchange is where that carbon dioxide gets absorbed. There are spots in the around the globe that, that have injection coming up from the crust of the earth. Um, there's a spot in Italy where it looks like you're snorkeling in, in misty bubbles. Um, there's a spot in the Indo-Pacific, I think, called MAUG, M-A-U-G. That's another one that has these really fizzy bubbles coming up, ne and they're near... Um, uh, tectonic activity is where we usually see those. Um, and so those have become natural laboratories for ocean acidification scientists to go there and look to see what, what does those conditions, what do those conditions look like? Um, because we can't really simulate that on a large scale um, uh, in, in some of these other systems. Good question though. Great question. So we have another one coming in from Miss Rose's students and they would like to know, Phil, um, the results that you showed, do they conclude that pH has an effect on how uh, shellfish or crustaceans navigate in the ocean? Yes, for these two species, um, so we, we did this work and we published it, and so that means it went through peer review with other scientists who uh, are anonymous who critique your work. Um, and so these are published works. These two studies show that um, for stone crabs, at least, they do have some type of disorientation that happens. And for spiny lobsters, it's a little bit more complicated. We think that maybe the pH might change the chemical cue of the algae. Maybe the, the pH might also alter the antennae and how the lobsters are able to perceive that chemical cue. Um, because we did still have lobsters make a correct choice. Um, it just wasn't to the high extent that we saw in the control. Right. Good question. I, I personally love the fact that you put the lobsters through a little maze. I think that's great. Uh, we'll do one more <laughs> question uh, and then we'll switch it over to Dr. Amelia. Um, and again, we're going back to Mrs. Young's class. They would like to know what about the sun? What about the algae that proliferates when CO2 is present? I'm sorry, can you say that again? So they want to know what about the sun? How does that impact ocean acidification? Um, and does that, what about the algae that it proliferates or grows when CO2 is present. Does that have an impact on ocean acidification and um, stone crabs and lobsters? Um, so, so the sun, right? You said you said the sun, right? Yeah. So the yeah. sun, the algae needs the sun to grow. Um, I don't know of the sun having a direct impact on the whole uh, acidification process. Um, is that the question, or is there? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Okay. <laughs> Um, all right, awesome. Well, thank you. So, uh, yeah, thank you. and thank you, um, 
Mrs. Young's class and everybody for submitting questions. Uh, we will continue to take questions. So if you come up with another question for Phil or one for Amelia, um, please let us know. But for now, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Amelia Harrington uh, with Maine Scene Grant. And she's gonna tell us more about her work and how it relates to ocean acidification. Great, thank you. So yeah, my name is Amalia Harrington and I am currently um, living in Maine where I work um, as Maine Sea Grant as a Marine Extension Associate. Um, but I actually, I grew up in Michigan, kind of in the middle of the country, um, so no ocean, but I developed, uh, like Phil early on, a really great love for marine science. Um, so I decided that I needed to move to somewhere on the coast for college. So I moved to California, San Diego, um, and I never really looked back. So I've been living on the coast doing marine science pretty much ever since. Um, and so when I started in San Diego, I attended the University of San Diego and first got involved in a project looking at how coral reefs respond to changes in their environment. And I got pretty much hooked on working in the nearshore environment and doing things with scuba and, and really working with species that are important. So um, I decided to stay in California and attended San Diego State University where I did a master's project that looked at how California spiny lobsters, so similar to the spiny lobsters Phil talked about, but on the opposite side of the country, um, how they use their habitat and what makes for a good home for them. So I got to work with a lot of um, other researchers, fishermen and managers, and it was really a great way to get uh, involved with lobster ecology. And um, I decided to keep working with lobsters, but uh, in a different side of the country, moving to Maine as a PhD student at the University of Maine. Um, and I've continued that work as a postdoc and now at my time at Maine Sea Grant, really trying to understand how environmental change affects all life history stages of American lobster from very small all the way up to adults. And similar to what Phil mentioned with the crustacean species that he looked at, American lobsters, Homerus americanus, are extremely valuable in the Northeast. And when you think about the state I live in now, Maine, um, this species is worth over a billion dollars, and that's including things like the fishermen, as well as boat builders and bait, as well as tourism and restaurants. So they're extremely iconic and important to our way of life here on the Northeast and in Maine. Um, and so American lobsters can be found off the waters of um, North Carolina and all the way up into Canada, but the majority of their population is right now concentration concentrated in the Gulf of Maine region outlined in the orange box here. And this is an area that's experiencing a lot of really rapid change. So it's warming faster than almost anywhere else on the planet. It's experiencing these large scale um, changes in acidification. So these global patterns, but also these more localized patterns um, in coastal acidification. So if you click to the next image, what we have in Maine is a lot of rivers that run off into our nearshore environment. And like Phil mentioned, when you have a lot of runoff, you bring not only fresh water, but nutrients into these areas. And mixing with the uh, cold ocean water of the Gulf, you get these um, very localized plumes of corrosive water, which you can see by those red um, areas near the shore. And so this has a really negative effect on shell forming organisms. And because lobsters are important to um, pretty much everything in Maine, um, we need to understand not only what's happening to their biology, but what this might mean for the fishery. So a lot of the early work that's been done looking at the effects of acidification on lobsters have focused really on the early life history stage. Um, so the larval stage of lobsters. Um, and in general, um, when you think about the, the shorter life history stage, but overall there are these negative effects um, on on larvae, so it makes it harder for them to survive. It also makes them harder to go through the different um, stages of their, their development. Um, but some of the work that's been done on adult lobsters suggests that they really don't have much of a hard problem in terms of making their exoskeleton. So acidification doesn't dissolve their, their hard parts or anything. But a lot of questions remain, especially when it comes to thinking about um, the ability of females to reproduce and the energy that might be required um, in the context of acidification. But really my work tries to fill in sort of the gap between these two large uh, chunks of life history and look at the juvenile stages. So these are the lobsters that are already on the seafloor, but they're not yet these big adults that are capable of making babies. So what happens to them could have huge impacts um, down the line as they become adults and, and how they are successful in terms of adulthood and making more offspring. 
And so a lot of the work that I've been doing lately is mostly field based and I've worked with some colleagues at the aquaculture research center here at the university. To design this really cool ocean acidification lab, so this is a picture of of our room where we have all of these really great sealed replicant. Um, recirculating seawater systems where we have great control over both the chemistry and the temperature of our water in our systems. So we can change things to however we want. So in this example, we'll be talking about current uh, pH conditions versus acidified conditions where we pump in CO2 to get the pH levels that we want. And then we see how lobsters respond. And this is really uh, a pretty straightforward example. Um, so it's, it's generally an exposure experiment. So we take our juvenile lobsters, which are pictured up at the top, and introduce them to our tanks. Uh, that's what one of the tanks looks like, this, uh, that black, black picture in the middle. And then we let them sit there and, and experience the different conditions for about 40 to 60 days, depending on the experiment. And then at the end of that time period, we take a whole bunch of samples to get an idea of what's going on in their tissues, their blood, and then to get some other physiological endpoints, thinking about how their heart rate changes during stress and looking into immunity. So I'm going to talk about some of these other things in a little bit, but my favorite part is measuring heart rate during stress because I think it's the most, uh, most exciting. So basically what we do for each individual lobster, and you can see a picture of our, our test subject there, is we very carefully hand drill two tiny holes on either side of the heart through the carapace, so through the hard parts on the back of the lobster. And then we embed these little tiny electrodes. And these are this is a pretty minimally invasive procedure, but we give the lobsters a little bit of time to get used to the, the setup before we put them into our experimental arena. Um, and you can, yep. So our arena is this uh, styrofoam cooler in the middle of the picture. And what we do is we put them through a temperature stress experiment. So we increase the temperature of the water bath. And then what we can do is measure in real time heart rate as well as a change in the temperature. And so this gives us an idea right here. You can see the heart rate in red, and then it's a little bit hard to see, but there's a blue line at the bottom that shows us our temperature. And really what this is sort of similar to is if we were to put you as a person on a treadmill and then gradually increase the speed as you're running and running and running, we can see the measure of your heart rate to get an idea of how stressed out you might be physiologically. So we do this and we get something that looks like this figure here. So what you're looking at is the temperature range that we test. I know this is in Celsius, but this is really going from about 55 degrees Fahrenheit to maybe about 85 Fahrenheit on the, on the bottom of the x-axis. And then we're looking at heart rate for our lobsters in our different groups. So the light blue circles are the heart rate for lobsters exposed to control conditions or control pH conditions. And then the dark blue is lobsters that experienced an acidified or a lower pH condition. So in both of our groups, as we increase the temperature, we see an increase in the heart rate. And again, this makes sense if you think about the treadmill, you're running faster, you're breathing harder, all of your, all of your metabolic rates are gonna increase. But as we push lobsters even further, we see that the heart rate starts to become a little bit more erratic and eventually starts to fall. And so if we push these lobsters even further, we might see the heart rate go to zero because they just really don't have capacity to deal with increasing stress. So although we see the same pattern of this increase and decrease as we push them through their, their temperature comfort zones, what we're really looking for is this break temperature or this point where the heart rate starts to decrease with increasing temperature. So if you click one more, yep. So that's what we're looking for here and trying to get an idea of sort of whole animal uh, stress test response. And when we calculate that for our different groups, we do in fact see that lobsters exposed to acidified conditions on the left-hand side here have a significantly lower break temperature than those under control conditions. And this is about two degrees Fahrenheit. And so basically what this is meaning is that these lobsters have less ability to deal with these stressors. So something's going on when they're responding to an acidified environment that has this impact in their physiological capacity to deal with another stressor. And recently we've been doing some experiments where we add in both predicted warming and predicted acidification. And we find that this break temperature decreases by about five and a half degrees Fahrenheit compared to control conditions. So really has a huge impact on the juvenile lobsters that we've been working with here. Now we looked at a couple of other things too. Uh, we took some blood samples or hemolymph samples and we've done some processing um, basically, we take the samples, um, put them through a colorimetric assay where we add some chemicals and look for changes 
in the color of the samples to get us a, an idea of the concentration of a, a bunch of different things. And overall, we didn't see a huge change in, in a lot of the metrics that we looked at, except for the molecule called L-lactate, which decreased significantly in response to acidification. And this is important because L-lactate's involved in oxygen transport, and it could be related to that, that reduced capacity to deal with stress and relate to the lower uh, break temperature that we saw on the previous slide. And, and finally, one thing that we've been getting into a lot lately is trying to look at the, the follow-on immune response um, in the context of acidification. So again, we can take our hemolym for our blood samples. And in this case, what we're doing is we're actually counting the number of immune cells, which you can see in that middle panel here, uh, those little dark circles on there. Those are the immune cells or the hemocytes. And what we've seen is that under acidification, the number of immune cells actually decreases which means that these lobsters could be at risk for uh, greater susceptibility to infection. And they also might have a hard time uh, with clotting because these cells are involved in wound healing. And if you ever have seen American lobsters, they're very aggressive. They interact with each other with their claws. So this could be a problem if they're interacting with, with their friends, if they have a problem uh, healing their wounds. And we've also, oop, one more thing. We've taken this one step further and actually have exposed and challenged lobsters to a bacterial infection, which you can see plated. Those little circles are the different uh, pathogens on there. And we found that especially when we add in warming, um, lobsters exposed to acidification die faster when they're infected um, than lobsters under control conditions. So there's clearly an effect of, of acidification going on in, in the immune response. So I'm with the question real quick, because we oh, yeah. it just came in as you were talking, and that is, how do you draw a blood sample from a lobster? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and you can kind of see in the picture on the on the left hand side there, what we do is we use uh, really small needles and just do a quick little blood draw. They have a really nice um, uh, vein along their, their back, basically, their, the um, dorsal side. And it's really easy to just go in and carefully pull some some blood out. Um, so pretty easy. Yeah. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. So overall from, from the lab work that we've done, um, we found that in general, acidification has some, some negative effects on the biology and physiology of juvenile lobsters. But really what we have to do next is figure out what this means for them as adults. So are there any lingering effects um, to this? And also a lot of this work is done in the lab, right? So we need to think how do we be more realistic when we're doing these, uh, these experiments? And especially thinking about um, acidification, putting in other stressors, especially warming. Um, because you know, it's not just gonna be acidification that these lobsters have to deal with in the, in the natural environment. So there are a lot of questions that still need to be answered. Um, but there's a lot of great work that's going on, um, particularly in my new position, I get to be involved in a whole lot of new um, experiments. Um, so if you go to the next slide, I am currently, as, as a, an associate at uh, Maine Sea Grant, I am the regional coordinator for the Sea Grant American Lobster Initiative, which is a, a project along the Northeast that involves researchers, which are the blue dots on this map here, as well as extension associates from other uh, Sea Grant groups um, in red, all along the Northeast, working on projects to understand how environmental change, including acidification, affects lobster. So this is really cool because we have these research teams, but we also have efforts looking at citizen science and industry-led projects. Um, and really my role is to help uh, communicate and coordinate these findings so that way people have a greater understanding of how this species will respond to a changing environment. And so you can check out our website. I think someone put it in the chat too, but we've got a lot of great things going on in events. So check it out for um, some future stuff if you're interested in lobster work. So we wanted to kind of end on a more positive note, thinking about how you all can help make a difference for our favorite uh, crustaceans. Um, so really the first thing to do is think about small changes you can do every day in your behavior that could have huge impacts. And the first thing that, that popped to mind was thinking of using um, more reusable containers instead of single use plastics, thinking about unplugging your electronics or turning lights off and water when you're walking away. So making sure you're not using more than you need. Um, you might not drive right now, but as you get older, thinking about walking or biking when you can or carpooling with your friends to things. And this last bullet here is really important, especially the map that, that Phil showed earlier, 
clean up after your pets because you don't want your dog poop to come in and, and hurt our, our favorite friends in the sea. Um, but on top of that, there are some more um, involved ways that you can get um, educated and involved when it comes to climate science and ocean acidification work. Um, there's a lot of great resources on the Environmental Protection Agency's website, as well as uh, NASA's Climate Kids website, with a whole bunch of different activities you can do with your class and your friends. You can also start to speak up more on social media and become really an advocate for climate science. And you can even sign up for a pledge to help reduce your carbon footprint as you get um, older. And this last bullet here is um, something that Phil's involved with, so I'm going to let him kind of jump in and, and speak a little bit more about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, you can also be an advocate for these uh, these animals and um, the changes that we're seeing and promote conservation. And so one of the things that I um, do on the side outside of my regular job is that I, I run a nonprofit called Youth Making Ripples. Um, Youth Making Ripples is uh, an educational nonprofit for students like yourselves to make basically short documentaries about issues that you're seeing in your area or, or environment and um, sharing them with us. And then we try to share them with a, a larger international audience. Um, we receive about a hundred submissions every year. Uh, all the films are less than five minutes. Um, we've, had, we've had films from all over the world. Uh, and some of those films have gone on to win awards or even affect local change in uh, some, of the, some of the local communities. Um, so it's a really great opportunity for, for you guys to all be involved and, and kind of stand up for some of these animals that might be threatened by the changes that are happening. Awesome. Thank you both so much. Those are great uh, uh, tips and, and also great organizations to check out. So we'll make sure we put those links in the chat too. All right. So we're going to go back for some more questions. And um, Amelia, I'm going to send one to you first. And that is, do the results of your experiments with the lobsters apply to more than just the American lobster? Um, and how, I thought this one was interesting, it's a two-part question, but how do the crustaceans sense the pH of their surroundings? So great questions. Um, a lot of the work that we've been doing with American lobsters um, follows similar protocols and methods in other species too. So you might expect to see similar trends under same kinds of conditions in, in species that have the same kind of environments and the same kind of um, life history strategies. So things like crabs, um, other lobster species as well. But um, you wouldn't necessarily expect them to have the exact same break temperatures or the exact same thresholds because there is some window of flexibility to acclimate to environmental stress. So lobsters have a lot of of internal mechanisms to help deal with a changing environment. So getting to that second question about sensing the pH and kind of dealing with that, um, they have a great regulation system within their blood that helps them deal with changes in chemistry. So they can help what's called buffer the hemolymph. In, so basically they, they change the amounts of proteins and other molecules in their blood to help offset the pH of their environment. So they can pump in different ions and release other ions. Uh, so that way they can stay more comfortable in, in the environment that they're in. Um, the other thing to think about too, is that um, lobsters are mobile creatures. So they can kind of move out of areas when they're not happy. So one thing to keep in the back of your mind here is all of this is lab-based and, and our friends can't really get away and find a new place that's happy. Um, so there is some potential to think about um, them uh, acclimating to a changing environment as well. Yeah. Excellent. Now, um, we did have a question coming in and um, I'll throw, I guess uh, maybe you guys can both take it. And that is, do you think the results of your studies collaborate with each other? Do, you, do they kind of give you the same results looking at crustaceans? Um, on, on some level, I think they do. Um, you know, we both, work with the earlier life stages. And, and um, so in my, in my case, we, we see effects on the larvae um, <clears throat> and the post larvae. Um, and uh, we haven't done any work on the juveniles yet, so we're not sure. Um, but we've also done some work with the adults and we don't see any effect on the adults. Um, they can calcify okay. They don't really 
die under those conditions. Sometimes they get a little sluggish, but then they bounce back. Um, so it's mostly on, 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 I think, one of the similarities between our work is that the, the early life stages have some sensitivity to these changes. Yeah, and the, the other thing to point out too is that um, American lobsters have a lot fewer larval stages than the <laughs> California spiny lobsters. So um, they're a little bit uh, easier to work with in the lab too when you're thinking about uh, lab-based experiments. But I do think, you know, you know, Phil said it right, like the, the early life stages are really crucial when it comes to understanding the sort of long-term impacts of acidification on, on these important species. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if, if, the, if the larvae and the juveniles can't survive to become adults, then that's the end of the population, right? They have right. to reproduce. There's no more adults making more babies. And yeah, then, sure. yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so um, we're gonna wrap up here, but I wanted to take uh, one more question. Um, and that is uh, from Mrs. Young's class, where I would like to know, are there any animals that can take in carbon dioxide the way that plants do to try and balance the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the ocean? So uh, there are algae, algal species yeah. that are really good. They're similar to plants. They do the same kind of thing. But uh, as far as animals, I, I can't really yeah, I think know. of anything that would be anything close to a plant. So yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, algae. Um, and so in Florida, we or the tropics, we have seagrass and mangroves. Um, those are plants, though. But uh, we we do see those habitats um, buffer against extreme changes in pH. And, and we're doing some work right now in, in our local Tampa Bay, looking at um, uh, seagrass habitats for muddy habitats and, and crabs from those habitats are better acclimated to changes in pH. Um, so the class that asked that question, you guys should come down and join my lab for the summer. Mm. I love it. I think they're in California, so that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you both so much for sharing your work and your knowledge and helping us celebrate this Ocean Acidification Day of Action. We really appreciate you being here. Um, I wanted to share um, Dr. Harrington's information, and you can also follow along with Sea Grants um, in all of their adventures that they have and find out more about the work that they do. She was also nice enough to offer uh, her email address. So if you watching have really specific American lobster questions or main questions, make sure to send them her way. Uh, Dr. Gravenis also gave us his information. I really encourage all of you to check out the Youth Making Rip, uh, Ripples Film Festival. Um, and also you can follow along his adventures as well. And he gave us our email too. So thank you both so much. Um, we you're also welcome. want to encourage everybody to connect with us at EarthGo. So if you're not already, go ahead and follow us on social channels and subscribe to our YouTube channel. So that when we go live with uh, great events like this one, you will get notifications. And uh, before we wrap up, I just want to say, everyone, thanks again so much for joining us. Make sure you go out and try to take one action against ocean acidification today. Uh, thank you so much for joining, and we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. <laughs>